Well, if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 17 this morning. Acts chapter 17. We're going to be looking at the first nine verses of Acts chapter 17. At several points in my life, God has uh, changed the direction and the course of where I was, was going. Oftentimes, uh, this is where I thought I wanted to go, and I was asking God's blessing on that. And kind of the first major life-changing uh, decision that I made was in, right out of high school and what I was going to do career-wise and in, in, in college. And so I, uh, I think I've shared with you before, I wanted to uh, work in uh, behind the scenes in the Christian music industry, doing audio engineering and, and that kind of thing. So I uh, enrolled and got accepted to uh, Middle Tennessee State University, which has one of the best audio engineering programs in the entire country. Uh, down in Murfreesboro, which is right outside about 20, um, 30 minutes or so southeast of, of Nashville. And uh, I, I remember going down there and never being to at Murfreesboro before, but I uh, enjoyed my, my time. I was there for several years, and it was, an, it was a nice town. I mean, it was definitely bigger than Lawrenceburg, where I was, was from, but it wasn't a huge city like, like Murfreesboro was. It was far enough to where, you know, there was kind of a, a it was disconnected. It had its own identity, and, and uh, for me, it had both a Chick-fil-A and a, a Fazoli's, and so... I'm, I mean, what, what more does a man need? <laughs> and, uh, but uh, a few years ago, we, we went back to Murfreesboro. Jess's uh, cousin was getting married, and they lived down in, in Murfreesboro. And as we were, were driving down there and, and, and staying there for a couple of days, it's amazing how in just, I don't know, 10, 15 years, a city could change. It looked completely, completely different than when, when I was, was there. And in fact, I... I remember one of my professors talking about um, kind of the difference of Murfreesboro with that of the more affluent uh, suburbs of Nashville, such as Brentwood or Franklin, where all the, the country music and, and Christian artists uh, live. And, and this is how he kind of compared the two. And I remember he said, he said, you know, in Murfreesboro, we don't have the kind of people that can bring in an olive garden. Now... <laughs> Now, I would say Olive Garden is like a step above Fazoli's, okay? You know, uh, but I don't really consider Olive Garden to be an affluent type of, of restaurant. But, but that's how this professor alluded to it. And, and now, as far as I can tell you, Murfreesboro does have an Olive Garden because it has changed. Even the, the, the church that I, I went to, I remember it was a, a nice, I mean, it was a little bigger than ours. There's a couple of hundred people in, in this church. But when I was there, the church... Uh, went through some some turmoil. Uh, pastor was asked to leave because of some some moral reasons, and and so there was a, kind of just a struggle. But yet it was a very uh, family kind of centered church, and they, even as a young college student, kind of adopted me into the church. But in the ten to fifteen years since I was there, that church has has ballooned, and now. Uh, runs close to ten thousand people, um, and it, it's amazing and just relatively short period of time how things can change and so we see sometimes things can can change uh, you know in, in growth wise as far as because really Nashville has gotten bigger that's why Murfreesboro has grown really now it is even though it's 30 minutes away is just a an extension of of Nashville but we also see that times can change negatively uh, you know if you've You've heard of the, of the town that was once a thriving small town, but because of economic depression, a factory moves out or what, is that there's nothing there. And you drive through and you see boarded up businesses and, and it looks like, like a ghost town. Well, change happens constantly. All right? I'm not telling you anything. It happens constantly. Now, some change is, is, is slight. They're barely noticeable at the moment until they add up over time. Just look at the growth of a child. You know, you don't really see them every day because you're around them, but eventually you realize, whoa, they've, they've actually grown. But some changes are big, and they incur suddenly, and, and, and they can catch people off, off guard. But there's no event in the history of the world that compares with the transformation that the world brought about by the birth, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, the gospel, the gospel changed everything. 
And its results are not just for this world, but are for eternity. Paul wrote the book of Romans chapter 1, verse 16. He says, "What for I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. See, the gospel began with a seismic salvation event that continues to send waves of spiritual change across the world. I mean, we heard just a little bit about that through our missions moments this morning. How through our cooperative program, giving goes to the seminaries to help train men and women to become pastors, to become missionaries around the world. And through that, sometimes you might get a text message from a man from Central Asia who you poured your life into for years saying, I want a Bible. The gospel continues to change lives. And the risen Lord commissioned us, you and me, as his followers to to take this life-changing gospel message to all the nations of the world, right? That's the great commission in Matthew chapter 28. But he told us that we're not going to do it on our own, right? Because he says that he promised that the Holy Spirit would empower us to be his witnesses. So in other words, we, you, and I would become the change agents for God in a fallen, topsy-turny world. Let me say that again. We, all right here, you, me, right? Not the superstars. I mean, I love you all, but we're the average Joes, okay? But God has called us to become the change agents for God in this fallen, topsy-turvy world. Think about the privilege that that is that God called you, each and every one of you, where you're at right now in this world, to become a change agent for him. The Apostle Paul <laughs> He kind of set the example for, for serving as a gospel change agent. The second half of, of Acts chapter, or the book of Acts, is filled with the accounts of how he led other Christ followers, he and other Christ followers took seriously the Great Commission. They lived it out every single day, and they were led by the Holy Spirit, and they developed strategies to take the gospel to places for, for people groups who had yet to hear about the life changing power. Of Jesus. And one of those places that was the ancient city of Thessalonica. So Paul and Silas, and probably Timothy, uh, came to this city during their second missionary journey. Now, Paul and and Silas' time in in Thessalonica can, can teach us a lot about turning the world upside down for God in in our day. We're going to see this in in three particular ways. One, to have a strategy for sharing the gospel. Two, start churches. And three, meet hostility with bold faith. First, to have a strategy for sharing the gospel. Let's look here in Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 3. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. So situated here in this natural harbor at the intersection of two major Roman roads, Thessalonica was a bustling trade center. Center, all right? And if you were here last year, we spent several months going through Paul's letter to the church in Thessalonica, so it's somewhat familiar to us. But like the other major Greek cities, uh, Thessalonica's religious landscape, it was very diverse, and, and, and it was predominantly pagan. But there was a, a synagogue there. And so that leads us to say that there was a substantial Jewish community in Thessalonica. However, though, the city was also the center for emperor worship. 
and home of many shrines that were dedicated to the national and local pagan deities. Now, Paul's strategy as he went from town to town and and evangelizing the cities was to start at the local synagogue when there was one that was there. And so here we would see that he would draw from the Old Testament scriptures that spoke of the Messiah. And then what he would do is he would point them to the fulfillment of those scriptures in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Thus, Paul's first converts in most of these cities were usually the Jews. And what we would say, God-fearers. People that, you know, in today's time we might call them God-seekers. They were kind of interested in Christianity, in Jesus, because of their interest in the God of the Bible. So for us, what is our strategy for sharing the gospel? We see that, that Paul had a strategy. From town to town, he went, started in the Jewish synagogues, speaking of the Old Testament scriptures, pointing the Jewish believers and other God-fears to, to Christ. He knew what he was going to do. But what is your strategy for sharing the gospel? What is my strategy for sharing the gospel because I'm going to find that most of the time, I'm not going to say it has never happened because I believe it can, but most of the time, gospel opportunities just don't happen by accident. A lot of times we must be on mission. We must be thinking. We must have a strategy for how to, to share the gospel. And I was thinking of some ways that might be things that might be helpful for us as Christ followers to, to kind of come up with a, with a strategy to be proactive in, in taking the gospel. I think the most important thing that we can do is to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. It's to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. And we do that through through reading, studying His Word, through praying, communion with, with God. But we, we don't focus on ourself or our family or our job, our community or the world because when we become the center of our attention and other people, humans and, and, and world events, we tend to get distracted. When we focus on ourselves, we become selfish, Right? When we focus on other people, even as good intentions that we might have, it is, it is still, we're, we're still uh, kind of selling ourselves short. Oftentimes when we just focus on the world in our own town, it's easy to become pessimistic and cynical about the things of how the, the state of current affairs are. But when we, when we have our eyes focused on Jesus... Everything else becomes into to focus in the way that God calls us to see the world. See, we are to have kingdom eyes. It's not that we're not to, 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 to think about ourselves or to think and care for our family, our friends, our, our jobs, our community, or the world, but, but we're to view these things with the proper perspective. And we're to see them through the eyes of, of Jesus. When we, began, when we began seeing other people, and particularly those difficult people, we've all got them. Uh, either they're our coworkers, our family. Not, don't raise any hands. But uh, you know, we, we've all got difficult people in our, our lives. But when we begin to look at them with kingdom eyes, we see them as image bearers of God. People who are, as we talked in our Sunday school class this morning, that, that are enslaved and bondage to, to sin. And they need to be released of that. But we know that we cannot release ourselves of slavery. No, it must come from someone else, and that is Jesus Christ. So when we begin to see people through kingdom eyes, we don't see others and events and things as obstacles to what we want to do or what we want to accomplish, but yet we see them as opportunities that God is giving us to share the greatest message in the history of the world. So we must keep our eyes focused 
on Jesus. All right? We're going to sing it here. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Right? Look full in his wonderful face. The things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Oh, those are so true words. But secondly, we, I think we can be helpful to, to be trained. You know, one of the greatest you know, obstacles that we find in sharing the gospel is I just don't know enough. I'm afraid that if somebody's going to ask me a question and I, I, I don't know the answer to, and let me tell you, I, you know, I'm a pastor, I've got a seminary education, and I always get asked questions that I don't know the answer to. It's okay to say, I don't know. Sometimes it's good, well, let me go look it up, or why don't you kind of, we look it up together and try to figure this out together. But it's important for us, though, to, to at least have some training in how to engage with somebody with the gospel. Right? That's why we're doing our three circles training on Sunday nights. That's why we, got, we give you homework to go out and get your reps in, right? To, to be able so that when you get into the situation, you, you have an idea of, of what to do. Right? Now, obviously, we're not going to do it perfectly I, I don't believe that in our eyes there is a perfect t- time and perfect ob- uh, way of sharing the gospel but we lean on the holy spirit to give us what to say he is at work in our gospel conversations but it's important i mean you know we the the the, the, the burden is on us to to be able to effectively share the gospel and so I want us, you have the opportunity to do that. So please make it a point to come on Sunday. If you can't make it, let me know. Shoot me an email, text, give me a call. I will meet with you personally, and we will do it together. And if you want to, I'll even go with you, and we'll go, we'll go gospel sharing. All right, We'll go witnessing and to see how it, it is done. So we must keep our eyes focused on Jesus. We must be trained in how to share the gospel. And also... We must be filled with the Holy Spirit and step out in faith. Because you can know everything you need to know about the Bible. You can know how to share the gospel, but if you go in it on your own power, you're going to fail. right? Because the Holy Spirit is at work in us. He is the one that brings the opportunities for gospel conversations. I had one of those this past week. Wasn't really expecting it, but God brought it to me. It wasn't anything that that I did, but I stepped out in faith. And when the opportunity arose, just led into that conversation. Now the thing is, we we must take the step in faith. And that means that we're not gonna, we don't know necessarily what the result is going to be. We don't know how that person is going to to react, but we can look back all throughout the Bible. We can look back all throughout our lives and see God's faithfulness to fulfill his promises. One of those promises that we often cling to, but, but when it comes to stepping out in faith and sharing the gospel, we kind of forget is that I will never leave you nor forsake you. When you're in that the mode of, of taking the gospel to others, you must step out in faith and know that, that God will never leave you, that he is with you, that he will be with you and give you what to say, and he will not forsake you. My dad and I, we often text back and forth in just different gospel conversations that we've been a, having to say, and the thing that he's on now is that, that fishermen fish. I and mean, I shared that, that, that uh, parable uh, several weeks ago in our Hoosier One series that, you know what, we can all talk about fishing and do everything, but if you're truly a fisherman, you got to what? You got to fish. If you don't fish, you're not going to catch any, right? And that's true. We must just step out in faith, trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit and do some fishing. So we have to have a strategy for sharing the gospel. Secondly, we start churches. Now, I'll explain what I mean by that here in a minute. But let's look here, Acts 17, verse 14. Or I'm sorry, verse 4. And it said, Some of them were persuaded to join Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. So the Greek word here, to, this, to be joined, kind of gives this idea of, of meaning to allot to. 
So, I mean, the idea is, is that God allotted to Paul and Silas a host of, of converts in Thessalonica. It is God that brought these people to faith in Christ. And so when you got a bunch of new Christians, what's the next thing that you need to do? Well, you need to start a church <laughs> and so that they could gather together. And so... You know, I mean, in fact, that we, we see that Paul wrote two letters to the Thessalonians in the New Testament about the same time that we're, we're reading this in Acts. It reveals that a thriving church was established in the city even before Paul and Silas moved on to the other areas. So, Paul and Silas planted the church in Thessalonica. And the congregation took cues from, from the other churches in Judea and, about, and, and the apostles' teaching as how believers are to grow and in their faith and impact the surrounding culture for Christ. Why is it important that believers be incorporated into the local body, a local church? Well, I think there's a few reasons for that. One of them is that it is biblical. Right? This is the pattern that is set before us in Scripture. Right? They are saved and they join into the church in the New Testament. They, in the beginning of Acts, the first church, it says they broke bread daily. Right? They, the church was everything about the every day they went to church. And really, I mean, it's up in the last several hundred years has that changed to where it's kind of a, just a, a weekly or a bi, you know, we come Sunday, Wednesday type of, of thing. In fact, Charles Spurgeon, the great pastor at the Metro, Metropolitan Baptist Tabernacle in London, preached every, every day. They had services every single day. Now, I can't imagine preaching you know, five, six sermons a, a week. That Man, that would uh, do me in, but... But they had church every, every day throughout the week, during the, during the day. And in, in the book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews says, for us to not forsake the assembly. Don't forsake the assembly. And I, uh, you know, I look so forward to each Sunday getting to come together with our church and I'm putting my prayer. It's like a, a, a family reunion. You know, some of us we see throughout the week, but others, this is our only opportunity to see, to see what's going on in our, our lives, to encourage one and to build one another up in the faith and for the sole purpose of, of worshiping the Lord. Now, I mean, we've heard it say, you know, I can worship out on the boat or I can worship at the game, and, and I, I would hope so. And I hope we can, we're, because we're not confined to a specific location. But there's something special about escaping from the world, to come once a week, ever so often, however often that is for you, for the sole purpose of worshiping the Lord, of studying God's word, of hearing it preached to you. Kind of take the you know, analogy of, of going to school. All right, kids in school, we got teachers here, is that, you know what, you can learn outside of school. And I hope you do. <laughs> Because if you're just leaning on what you get in school, you're, you're not getting the, the full uh, encompass picture of of. Of, of learning to, to have success in life. But you know what? It, the purpose is, of school is solely for learning. And we place great importance on learning in school, and I firmly uh, believe in that. But we also see that the new believers need more mature believers to, 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 to learn from and to, to emulate with them. Right? New believers need to be around more mature believers so that they can, they can see, they can learn from them. What is it to, what, how are we to live as, as followers of Christ? My encouragement to us as those that are more mature in your faith is, is be the kind of church member, be the kind of Christian that you would want a, a new member, a new Christ follower to emulate. I think for some of us, it's like, you know what, I, I, I don't want to engage with, with a new believer. I don't want to help disciple somebody because, you know what, I don't know if I want them to, to be like me. If that's the case, then we've got our own repentance that we need. We need to turn from our own sin and, and continue to, as I said before, is to keep our focus on Christ. You know, but we also see that our more mature believers, those that have been in the church for, for decades, can, we can learn from our new believers as well. 
Think about when you first came to faith in Christ, how excited you were, because it was like you were seeing everything with fresh eyes for the first time. Sometimes we need, to, we need a little bit of excitement in our own selves. Uh, what a new Christian has. So we must have a strategy for sharing the gospel. Start churches. But lastly, we see that we must meet hostility with bold faith. We must meet hostility with bold faith. Read here with me, Acts 17, verses 5 through 9. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob and set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out of the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Now, as Paul and Silas continued to make new disciples in in Thessalonica, they they faced growing jealousy from the synagogue leaders. And this jealousy manifested itself in, into violent oppression as the Jewish leaders recruited some of the wicked men from the marketplace to, to start a riot in the city. Right, they, they were being deceitful, saying this riot was caused by Paul, Silas, and, and their friend Jason, who was housing them. Now, this riot got the attention of of the city officials who knew that they would be held responsible by the Roman government if this mayhem would continue. Now the opponents of of the gospel, they accused the believers, especially Paul and, and Silas, of committing sedition against Rome and by teaching Jesus Christ is king. Now this is a serious charge that they brought against Paul and Silas. And, and we know that the Romans were brutal in their punishment of of, of those who sought to overthrow the government. So we see this phrase, turned the world upside down. Now this phrase could also mean to, to make trouble. In other words, Paul and Silas were accused of causing trouble wherever they went. But the thing is, in reality, the gospel turns people's lives right side up right the gospel turns people's lives right side up in philippi the lord brought paul and where he's healed a slave girl as we saw last week who had been forced to work as a fortune teller for the profit of others and when this girl was set free from her spiritual bondage her life was turned right side up at the same time her healing made trouble for the girl's captors for her owners in the sense that it ruined their sinful profits. And so in turn, we saw that the owners retaliated against Paul and Silas. See, the gospel, it may indeed stir up opposition and even hostility from those who hold worldly power. Believers, though, are called to meet such opposition With bold faith. We can be confident that Christ will be with us and will use our faithfulness to turn lives and communities the right side up with the gospel. So how how can we be known for making trouble or turning the world upside down in, in a peaceful yet proactive way. I was reading this past week uh, about the great Protestant reformer John Knox from, from Scotland, the founder, been attributed to, of Presbyterianism. And, and Knox was one that felt himself often meeting hostility from others. Not only was he a reformer within the Catholic Church, but he also had to, was in resistance of uh, the Church of England, the Anglican Church. And so he was at odds with everybody and had very few worldly friends. 
fact, he went toe-to-toe with Mary, Queen of Scots. John Knox found himself often either in exile or in prison. But yet he always stood bold in his faith. Knox said this, he's a lot of great, great quotes, but one that really intrigued me, a couple did, is one, he says that when you are with God, no matter what you face, you are always in the majority. No matter what you encounter, no matter how much the odds are stacked against you, if you are on God's side, you're in the majority. Look at the battles fought throughout the Old Testament. They were the ones that they were successful in, they were always the underdog, right? But they weren't because they had God on their side. But another quote that really struck me about Knox, he said this, is that you cannot antagonize and influence at the same time. You cannot antagonize and influence at the same time. Now this is a man who always found himself in opposition to the religious leaders of his day as well as just the, 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 the culture at, at large. In fact, <laughs> Knox it, it said that everywhere he went he found corruption, whether in the church, in the government, in society. But he says you cannot antagonize and influence at the same time. So how do you stand bold in the faith and influence but not antagonize? Well, if we are going to face resistance, let it be because of the gospel and not our personality. Sometimes we're our worst enemies in making the name of Christ known because we can easily become just... Pardon my French, jerks. <laughs> you know, we just have an unpleasing attitude. It's like we just want to fight everybody. We just want to, you know, we, we feel like we've got to win each and every argument. And, and people just don't like us, not because of what we believe, but because of how we act. When we keep our focus, keep our eyes on Jesus, when we see the world with kingdom eyes, we will be living in obedience to God's word and fulfilling the great commandments to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And what? To love our neighbor as ourself. Now don't get me wrong, that's easier said than than done. And it's very difficult to love others that are in opposition to us. But we don't love on our own accord. We love through the power of the Holy Spirit. We can love, as the Bible says, because He first loved us. You will face hard times. You may even face hostility from those that you might even know and and care for, maybe within your own family. But we must keep sharing the gospel. Because it's the only thing that can that can change lives. It's the only thing that can turn the world right side up. Let me tell you, we're I'm not sure if you know this or not, but we have an election Tuesday. If anybody, uh, I'm, my mailbox has just been bombarded. Uh, kind of a joke. I give all that mail to Jess, and she <laughs> enjoys looking at all of that stuff. But, but it's pretty nasty, isn't it? Politics ain't gonna save us. Money's not gonna save us. Having a, you know, what a a good moralistic society is not going to save us. The gospels, the only thing that will save. So we keep sharing it. Have a strategy for how you are going to accomplish that. And brothers, pursue holiness. Pursue holiness. Continue to, to die to yourself and to live for Christ. There's some you here this morning that that need to experience the life changing power of of the gospel of of Jesus I may have shared a word Friday night to the uh, to our our fall festival and it says and I 
got it from the sermon I preached. Jesus plus what? Nothing. Equals everything. Some of us may be thinking, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but you know what? It's my church attendance that's going to get me into heaven. My Jesus plus me being a, being a good person is going to get me into heaven. Or Jesus plus all of the good, all of the money that I give for good causes, that's going to get me into heaven. No, brothers and sisters, it's only Jesus that's going to get you there. And the gospel's this. It's that Jesus came to live the life that you could not live. He lived a sinless life. He died the death that you and I deserve. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. Oh, but thankfully the verse doesn't in there. But the free gift of God is salvation in Christ Jesus our Lord. But if you've been here in three circles training, that's not the gospel, is it? No. On the third day, Jesus defeated death and he rose from the dead. And now he reigns at the right hand of the Father. That's it. It's a simple message, one that even a child could understand. But it is one that has life-altering ramifications. It's the gospel that we must believe. And if you have not believed it, I believe that God has brought you here to hear it. And I pray that today would be the day of your salvation. But it's the same message that we must share to the world. We must have a strategy. We must be ingrained, involved in the church. We must meet a hostility with with bold faith. Would you pray with me? Oh God, we thank you for who you are. Oh, we thank you. That you are a holy God, that you are a just God, that you are a righteous God. God, we know that that we cannot uphold your righteous standards. As Daniel sang earlier, God, we fail you and that failure is sin and that failure has condemned us to eternity in hell God oh you are a loving God and you sent your only son to live the life that we could not live to die the death that we deserve and to defeat death on the third day And only that our hope can be found in. God, I pray if there's anybody here this morning that has not yet given their life to Christ, that today would be the day of their salvation. That they would make that decision public before us here and before you this morning. God, I pray for all of us. That we would keep our eyes on Jesus. Oh, that we would look full in His wonderful face. And then everything comes into focus. We'll begin to see others with kingdom eyes. And we will see that the greatest need that anyone has is the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.